please let me introduce our first speaker. Anyone who has listened to the news last night and this morning recognizes that there may not be a more demanding job in the Reagan administration than that of National Security Advisor. But since being named to that position late last year, Frank Carlucci has shown that he has the ability to flourish in the job. Those who know him are not surprised. After serving in the U.S. Navy, Mr. Carlucci attended Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration, went into private industry, and then joined the State Department. He served in South Africa, the Congo, Zanzibar, and Brazil. Then he went to the Office of Economic Opportunity, where he became director. Next came the Office of Management and Budget, and later to the, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He left the government to serve as chairman and chief executive officer of Sears World Trade Incorporated. During that, t that time, I'm pleased to say that he also served as a board member of the American Stock Exchange. Then late last year, he received a call from the White House asking him to accept his current challenging post as NASA advisor. I am very pleased to introduce Frank Carlucci. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. And it's a pleasure for me to join you all at breakfast this morning. I don't have any kind of a prepared message. I thought I'd just chat with you a bit about uh, three key foreign policy uh, areas, the Persian Gulf, Central America, and our relations with the USSR. And let me start with the one that's been most in the news this weekend, uh, the Persian Gulf. I won't comment on the current situation, somewhat to the disappointment I know of our friends in the back here, uh, other than to say that uh, what happened was an outrageous act of aggression against Kuwait and the United States. And to note that the President has been reviewing his options over the weekend, and as he said last night, uh, he has uh, decided on a course of action. But it would be most inappropriate for me or anyone else at this point uh, to comment on the course of action. Instead, let me uh, take a step back and uh, discuss our policy there in somewhat broader terms. I don't need to remind a group such as this of the strategic importance uh, of the Gulf, which has two-thirds of the world's oil reserves, produces about 25 percent of the free world's uh, oil, nor do I have to remind you that uh, Oil is just one big pool that makes no difference whether it goes to Europe uh, or the United States. I would also note that the U.S. naval forces have been present in the Gulf for some 38 years, ever since uh, World War II. Reflagging Kuwaiti tankers is not a policy. It is a decision within the context of a policy, a policy which we have tried to articulate on a number of occasions, both in the public domain and in innumerable briefings uh, to our Congress. In a word, that policy is to maintain uh, the free flow of oil out of the Gulf, to work with the moderate Arab states to meet their legitimate security aspirations without upsetting the Arab-Israeli balance, and to work to bring an end to the Iran-Iraq war uh, without uh, victor or vanquished. And when Kuwait requested assistance, what we did was well within the context of that policy. And the U.S. Navy is certainly capable of escorting U.S. vessels on the high seas. We're not the only ones uh, doing it. Uh, the British uh, have reflagged Kuwaiti ships, uh, which they have been escorting. And since uh, this operation has begun, uh, we have 
truly developed a multinational force in the Gulf. There are French ships, there are Dutch ships, there are Belgian ships, uh, there are Italian ships, and there is a good degree of cooperation. There is also an unprecedented degree, unprecedented degree of cooperation uh, between us and the uh, Arab states, the Gulf Arab states. They don't like to talk about this cooperation for understandable reasons. Uh, if something should happen and we were to be pulled out of the Gulf, they feel they would be left alone uh, facing a hostile uh, enemy. But the cooperation is one that we would never have imagined a year or so ago. We're often asked, is our commitment open-ended? The answer to that is that the commitment to extend U.S. naval protection to U.S. flag vessels is open-ended. U.S. Navy's done that since its inception. But our presence in the Gulf is a reflection of the nature of the threat. And if the threat diminishes, our presence will diminish. We have been working very hard along with our allies at the UN to bring about a ceasefire in the Iran-Iraq war. Resolution 598 has passed. Uh, the Secretary General is actively engaged in negotiations with the two parties. And we think that uh, work has to proceed on a follow-on resolution which would impose an arms embargo on the party refusing to accept the ceasefire. And at this point, uh, uh, it looks like that party uh, is Iran. Iran has made no secret of its strategy. It talks about driving the United States out of the Gulf just like it drove the United States out of Lebanon by playing on U.S. Uh, domestic differences. And in this context, let me just comment for a moment on the debate going on in our Congress on the war powers issue. First, a couple of points. No president since the War Powers Act was passed over President Nixon's veto has accepted the constitutionality of the War Powers Act. But they have provided notice to the Congress consistent with the provisions of the War Powers Act. Jerry Ford did this at the time of the Maya Gaze incident. Jimmy Carter did it at the time of the Iran uh, rescue incident. Uh, we did it, Reagan administration did it at the time of Grenada and Lebanon. And we have done it uh, in the context of the Persian Gulf. In other words, the same kind of notification has been provided to the Congress. The Congress is involved in our Persian Gulf policy. They vote the appropriations that allow us to continue. They can vote up or down tomorrow on our policy in the Persian Gulf. There's absolutely nothing uh, to impede that. But the War Powers Act, in its construction, creates a lot of problems, leaving aside uh, the constitutionality issue. What the act says is that when U.S. forces are introduced, after a certain period of time, they are automatically pulled out unless the Congress votes to keep them in. Now think about that for a minute. What you are saying to friend and adversary is just hold out for that period of time because to the adversary, he may win by having the Congress fail to vote. Mind you, fail to vote. And friends look at us nervously and say, my goodness, until the Congress votes, and it's a 90-day period, should we get in there and help? So no matter where you introduce U.S. forces, you introduce this element of uncertainty. And the key ingredient in the success of a military operation is staying power. 
And I think a number of uh, legislators on the Hill, the more enlightened legislators, are coming to realize this and are beginning to recommend that the War Powers Act formulation be re-examined. Let me move on now to another area of strategic interest to those of us in the United States, although I recognize it's not an area of paramount interest to many of you in this room, and I speak of uh, Central America. There, there is no doubt that we have a communist beachhead on the mainland, a Marxist-Leninist government in Nicaragua, an oppressive government that has some 7,000 uh, political uh, prisoners. It is alleged that the Reagan administration is opposed to the peace process. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have pushed the peace process very hard. I myself visited with President Arias last January, came outside his house, had a press conference, and endorsed the process that he was in uh, undertaking. The policy of the Reagan administration has essentially been a three-track policy enunciated a number of months ago in a speech the President gave at Ellis Island. First component is support for the existing democracies in Central America. And there's been a veritable revolution down there. A number of years ago, there was only one democracy, Costa Rica. Now we have uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And we need to support uh, those democracies. Secondly, work with those democracies in the diplomatic path. And we have been actively uh, engaged uh, with them. And we welcome uh, the ARIAS plan, particularly the provisions that pertain to democratization in Central America. Those are good uh, provisions. We urged uh, that the plan be sequential, and that aspect was adopted, even though it was not in the original uh, ARIAS uh, plan. But the United States also has national security interests that go beyond the Guatemala Accord. And we do not, nor should we, expect the Central Americans to handle those national security interests for us. We tried to address those interests, the President did, in a plan that he came up with together uh, with Speaker Wright. And in our judgment, those concerns, the concerns articulated in that plan, are still valid. We think that the peace process has reached the point that it has reached today. Pressure through the freedom fighters, known uh, in the press as uh, Contras. We are supporting the Contras, A, because it's the right thing to do. These are people who are genuinely fighting uh, to get back in their homeland, but B, because it has been a very effective source of pressure on the Sandinistas. Ortega admitted as much in his speech to, uh, to the UN uh, the other day. And we think it would be a mistake to take this pressure off just when we are on uh, the verge of success. Democracy does not happen overnight. It does not happen on November 7th. It's a process. And we're delighted that La Prensa has been reopened and that Radio Católica is functioning. We hope they will keep functioning. And there needs to be a fail-safe mechanism to be sure uh, that that happens. And there needs to be an insurance policy to be sure uh, that the Soviet and Cuban troops are eventually withdrawn. And the Contras uh, represent that kind of insurance policy. Sure, if there is a negotiated ceasefire, and all the democratic presidents in Central America are urging the Sandinistas to negotiate directly with the Contras on a ceasefire, then we don't need uh, lethal aid. The force can be kept in being till they themselves 
judge that the democratic institutions are functioning and move on their own to be reintegrated into a Nicaraguan society. Finally, a word about our core relationship, relationship between us and the USSR. And I start from the premise that very far-reaching changes are taking place in the Soviet Union. Anyone who comes back from Moscow uh, will tell you that. But the jury, in my judgment at least, is still out on what those changes mean for the West in terms of foreign policy. There are those who argue that Gorbachev's goal is simply to make the Soviet Union more efficient. Right now, the only thing, as you're well aware, that the Soviet Union does that's efficient is make weapons. Uh, the rest of the Soviet Union is essentially a third-rate uh, power. And those who advocate this thesis say a more efficient Soviet Union is a more dangerous adversary, particularly given their recent proclivity to engage in uh, very effective uh, public relations. Then there are those who say, no, there is genuine openness coming about in Soviet society, and if that continues, it has to be reflected in a more accommodating uh, foreign policy. And we all hope that this is the case. Uh, but so far, with the exception of uh, the INF area, which is a special case, we have not seen the internal changes reflected in Soviet foreign policy, particularly in, uh, on regional issues and human rights issues. As you're well aware, uh, there is a foreign minister's meeting uh, scheduled this week in Moscow. Secretary Schultz will be going there from the Middle East. I and some others will be leaving tonight uh, to join him there. Uh, the press has billed this meeting as an arms control meeting. It's much broader than that. We intend to discuss our whole agenda uh, with the Soviets. That means bilateral issues, such as problems with our embassy, human rights issues, regional issues, as well as arms control. On human rights, we see a, a new tone. We see some things happening. We see some prominent refuseniks being uh, left out, some people getting out of prison. But it is still only a trickle. Emigration, Jewish emigration this year may be somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000. That compares with about 55,000 during the Brezhnev uh, era. So the Soviets have a long way uh, to go in human rights. But they are, and it's refreshing, they are willing to discuss uh, this issue uh, with us. Regional issues, we, fee we see very little progress in areas such as the continued massive uh, flow of Soviet arms uh, to Nicaragua, continued Soviet activities in Angola, continued support for uh, the Vietnamese uh, rape of Cambodia, or most significantly in Afghanistan, where the Soviet Union talks about getting out, but it also talks about leaving a communist government in place, and you can't do both. Uh, they really want to get out. It's very easy. It didn't take them long to get in. They just need to turn around and get out and leave uh, the area up to self-determination. Uh, in the arms reduction area, it is fair to say that we are making good progress on an INF agreement, and we would hope uh, that we can wrap that up while we're in Moscow, although there are still some issues of serious proportions uh, that have to be resolved, and we're not going to be driven by deadlines to taking any positions uh, that are not uh, advisable. We also plan to have a dialogue on a START treaty. The Soviets have emphasized the importance they attach to START, that is a reduction 
50% reduction in principle that we agreed upon in Reykjavik of the large destabilizing uh, strategic weapons uh, systems. And we're anxious to get on uh, with the negotiations. And I'd say prospects are reasonable, providing uh, the Soviets are willing to delink uh, start from so-called defense and space talks which really means an effort on their part to kill the SDI program, which will not happen as long as Ronald Reagan is president of the United States. And while we're negotiating with the Soviets, we have a problem, because we're negotiating on two fronts at once. Our Congress has, in our Defense Department authorization bill, programs or provisions, legislation, which is very similar to the Soviet negotiating position on the interpretation of the IBM, the ABM treaty, uh, on nuclear testing, and on SALT II sublimits. And this would be like uh, those of you in the business world trying to negotiate an acquisition with your board forcing on you uh, the position of the company uh, that you're trying to acquire or the position of somebody who's competing uh, for the acquisition. Extraordinarily difficult uh, to negotiate under these circumstances and somehow we have to find a way to work uh, better with the Congress on this issue. Let me close on this note. The other day the Wall Street Journal came in and asked what kind of a legacy the Reagan administration would have in, in foreign policy. I said, well, we, we don't see any Camp Davids. And I said, well, I suggest that there is uh, something equally as enduring, fundamental. If you look at uh, some of the accomplishments, it's clear uh, that the United States is conducting now an assertive foreign policy, uh, standing tall, conducting that policy with pride uh, from a basis of strength. It's equally clear that we are committed to supporting freedom fighters around the world, supporting forces fighting for democracy. And what is often overlooked is that there has been a real revolution in favor of democracy in the past eight or nine years. Just run your mind's eye over the countries, Brazil, Argentina, Central America, Philippines, uh, hopefully uh, Korea, any number of countries. 90% of uh, this hemisphere is either functioning under democratic systems or systems in transition uh, to democracy. Equally significantly, countries are moving towards uh, market-oriented policies, even in places like Africa, where one would have thought that socialist policies were locked in uh, in the early 1960s. We think we made some progress uh, in the international uh, trade area. We think the idea of moving a strategic deterrent from the mad doctrine, holding a revolver at one another's temple, uh, to a deterrent based on a stable combination of defense and offense is an extraordinary achievement. And the Soviets are beginning to agree with that in principle. And finally, there has been an element of stability and a new tone introduced in our relationship with the Soviets. A Soviet Union that is becoming uh, a more challenging competitor at the same time. All this being said, it is no time for the United States to be retreating from the world. And we have problems, budget problems, uh, on the Hill. Our foreign aid budget uh, has been slashed to the point where we're having trouble meeting our treaty commitments. Our State Department is being decimated. The flag is being hauled down. Embassies and consulates uh, around the world. And our defense budget is under uh, heavy fire. Defense budget has been going down in real terms in two, the last two years. And we're facing, under Graham Rudman Hollings, a 9 to 10 percent cut in our defense budget, and that will really hurt 
I know there's a budget problem, but the Graham Rubman Hollings formula would have defense 28% of the budget bear at least 50% uh, of the cuts. And for every dollar uh, that has been cut in the defense budget since 1982, $2 have been added to domestic spending, to non-defense uh, spending. We have our work to do, uh, all of us in the administration and in the Congress, uh, to get together on a set of common goals uh, in foreign policy. I think we are uh, making progress. It's extraordinarily difficult in this kind of an atmosphere, as you will well appreciate, but it is absolutely essential if we are to maintain the kind of legacy that I described and to move forward in the areas that I cited as being enormously important uh, to us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You have questions? Um, on the Persian Gulf, uh, would you welcome closer cooperation with Russia? And do you think such closer cooperation could bring the war closer to an end? Uh, yes and no. Um, we don't think uh, the Soviets have played a constructive role uh, in the Middle East, and we don't think there is any rationale for a heightened Soviet presence in the Persian Gulf. But we welcome and need their cooperation at the UN uh, in support of a follow-on resolution that would impose an arms embargo on those who are shipping uh, weapons into the Gulf. Do I think uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is in a strong position, strong enough position to accomplish the changes he's bringing about in the Soviet Union? Is he a strong man or is he um, an honest man that doesn't have the uh, strength? Let me say, first of all, it is clear that there is internal opposition uh, to the changes that uh, Gorbachev is trying to bring about opposition from the entrenched uh, bureaucracy. Uh, and it is very difficult uh, to even to get the average Soviet citizen uh, to think in terms of incentives uh, and uh, decentralization. So Gorbachev certainly has his work uh, cut out for him. But uh, every indication that uh, I have seen to date indicates that he has uh, maneuvered very astutely in the political uh, arena has consolidated his position uh, with uh, remarkable uh, speed and uh, seems to be on top of the political situation. So he's, he's handled himself well, but the kinds of changes he intends to bring about are of uh, enormous proportions, and uh, only time will uh, provide the final answer to your question. One more here. Could you say which areas of defense spending could be least painfully cut? Could I say which areas of defense spending could be least painfully cut? Uh, the administration tries to lay out priorities in its uh, budget um, presentation, and you, um, you always have to strike a balance between modernization and readiness and uh, sustainability. Um, <clears throat> in a period where you've got declining budgets, uh, it becomes important to protect readiness and sustainability. Uh, you do not uh, want to end up again uh, with a hollow army. On the other hand, the dilemma is that that's the money that spends out the fastest. And your budget constraints are usually put on you in the form of outlay constraints uh, so you're, you, the temptation is to hit 
uh, readiness and sustainability as well as stretching out uh, some of the procurement programs, which as you're well aware adds enormously to uh, the unit uh, costs. My own preference, and I understand Secretary Weinberger is speaking to you, and you might ask him this question. Um, my own preference is that if you have to take cuts, you take it in force structure and you bring everything down uh, together. And yes, you have to stretch out some procurement, but I'd much prefer to terminate uh, procurement. One of the pernicious aspects of Graham Mudd and Hollings is that while it forces budget cuts, it doesn't allow you to terminate anything. Uh, you can't close bases, you can't uh, terminate uh, contracts, you can't slow down any programs that the Congress uh, has, uh, has increased. Uh, so it uh, imposes the cuts in the most Byzantine uh, way that uh, one could possibly uh, imagine. Um, Mr. Riley, I'm going to have to get back. I thank you all and I wish you a very good uh, conference. On behalf of all of us, I'd like very much to thank Frank Carlucci, who obviously is in a pressure-filled environment uh, at this moment, and really appreciate the fact he could take the time to be with us this morning. C-SPAN's coverage of the American Stock Association Annual Investors Conference will continue after this. Since I made a promise about market reports before our next introduction, I should let you know that uh, at last count, the Dow Jones was down 140. Uh, IBM uh, has not yet opened. Um, so uh, it'll be an interesting morning. With that, <laughs> what I'd like to do is move from those market reports into our program again and introduce our next speaker. A little less than two months ago, on August 7th, the Securities and Exchange Commission received a new chairman. The views of David S. Reuter were always interesting, but on that day they became of vital significance to every one of us connected to the securities industry. That includes market professionals around the world and tens of millions of investors. Mr. Reuter did not come to Washington after long experience in a Wall Street firm or government agency, but that doesn't mean he came unprepared. In fact, whether you're discussing insider trading, tender offers, the national market system, stock distribution, or a host of other important questions, the chances are that Mr. Reuter has written and lectured on the issue. For 25 years, he has taught securities law, and in 1977, became dean of the School of Law at Northwestern University. During his tenure, he was instrumental in attracting the headquarters of the American Bar Association and other legal groups to the university, turning it into a great national legal center and resource. Two months is not long in a job that involves as much pressure and covers as many vital issues as the chairmanship of the SEC. But we've met with Mr. Reuter and no others in the industry who have worked with him. Even in that brief experience convinces us that he will carry on a remarkable tradition of great commission chairmen. As he does, our chairman, Arthur Levitt, will take special pride in recalling that he received his undergraduate degree at his own alma mater, Williams College. I'm pleased to be able to present to you the new chairman of the SEC, David Reuter. Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure to be here on this, uh, what may be historic day. Uh, first, may I thank the, the American Stock Exchange and its co-sponsors for providing me an opportunity to address this impressive gathering of chief executive officers from around the world. My topic today will be regulation of international securities markets. Uh, let me begin with a fish story. In 1938, a scientist discovered in the depths of the Indian Ocean a fish called the coelacanth. It was a species of fish that was believed to have been extinct for over six million years. This prehistoric fish swims backwards, drifts upside down, and even, even performs underwater headstands. While the behavioral characteristics of this living fossil may seem bizarre, it's the evolutionary hardiness of the species. It's survival through adaptive characteristics that is of particular relevance to my central theme today. Some commentators 
in the United States seem to view internationalization as a threat to the primacy of the U.S. markets and the integrity of the regulation of these markets. An implicit assumption of this discussion seems to be that international competition among securities markets will inevitably lead to a race to the bottom. Much discussion seems to center on the ways in which our regulations need to be reduced in order to adapt to the new international environment. While it is undeniable that favorable regulation will be a major factor in determining which financial centers will become dominant, the central question is, what is the most favorable regulatory climate? My view is that sound regulation enhances rather than detracts from the vitality of markets. International competition among regulators, therefore, should concentrate with vigor on those regulatory concepts that contribute to the vitality of securities markets, while at the same time recognizing the need to adapt to market changes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I forget my watch here, will you uh, give it to me as I retreat? Uh, my underlying assumption is that the extraordinary fairness, efficiency, and competitiveness of our U.S. markets are in large part attributable to the sound regulatory premises of our federal securities laws and to the adaptive regulation uh, by the Securities and Exchange Commission. I suggest, therefore, that just as our prehistoric fish exhibits fundamental qualities that might be emulated by other species, the fundamental soundness of U.S. securities law policy, coupled with Commission regulatory adaptability, presents a model for adoption in the international arena. My re remarks today will concentrate on several concepts that have such value in our markets that they merit incorporation with some adaptive change into the developing corpus of common global regulatory principles. In making the suggestions that follow, I recognize that not all of them are appropriate for all markets. Factors such as the nature of the products, the identities of investors, and the stage of market development may well affect the desirability of application of some of these principles. The primary task of securities regulators worldwide is to react to fast-moving international market changes. To some extent, the regulatory concepts must wait until we have seen how these markets, in fact, evolve. Nevertheless, regulatory initiatives must begin now, and discussion of the appropriate regulation of international markets must take into account current market structures, trends, and trading mechanisms. There is and has been a tremendous growth in volume in the international markets, and uh, the trading volume has been concentrated in, in various markets, including in each of the world's 57 national stock markets, uh, uh, increases in volume. And I think it's particularly impressive that the total value of equities now traded worldwide exceeds $6 trillion. Not only is the amount of equity trading important, but it's also important to note that this trading is, incur is incurred, occurring in an increasingly consolidated and automated global financial and communications network. For example, there is an increasing reliance upon automated quotation collection and dissemination systems within various domestic markets, most notably in the U.S. and in the United Kingdom with its SEAC and SEAC international systems. There is also an increasing trend toward a greater amount of automated execution uh, for smaller orders, with virtually every market now capable of uh, such execution. Moreover, private vendors are now offering both competing international securities information dissemination systems and even international execution capabilities in certain world-class securities. Plans already exist for expanding these systems to include other securities, including certain futures products. As you know, the automation systems that I have just described can be used to support an auction market such as that which occurs on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or a dealer market such as the NASDAQ market. An upstairs market may also exist even in connection with an exchange market. To an extent, 
international, internationalizations of securities markets is increasing the competitions between various systems, between system using, systems using auction uh, market trading principles and those using dealer trading principles. The recent demise of the trading floor in London and its replacement in effect by the CX system is perhaps, perhaps the earliest evidence of one outcome of this struggle. While, while it is not possible to predict which system or which variation of which system will prevail, or whether they will coexist, regulators confronting internationalization must keep in mind that this market struggle is, in, is a part of the context in which they are operating. These comments are not entitled, intended to argue that, uh, that internationalization is necessarily going to be driven by imitation of US regulation. Rather, the point is that the growth of international markets is taking place in an arena containing a regulated U.S. securities market that is strong and is regulatory, regulatorily adaptive. Most important, I believe that the continuing efficiency and fairness of the U.S. markets has made them healthy competitors in the international environment. I believe that our regulatory concepts not only contribute to this result, but offer a model that should be followed by other markets. Now, what are the attributes of the regulations which we have in the United States, and how might they be applied to other markets? First of all, our federal regulations require fair and full disclosure. Uh, information uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is present about various companies directly increases the economic efficiency of our markets, since investment decisions will be made on a fully informed basis. A fully informed market is likely to be a fair market, in turn encouraging greater invest investor confidence in market participation. participation. I believe that this adequate and good disclosure is so basic to market fairness and to market efficiency that one of the initial international regulatory goals must be the development of minimum, minimum disclosure standards. Given the importance of financial disclosure, a key first element of international disclosure standards will be to develop mutually acceptable international accounting and auditing standards. A second essential principle that underlies U.S. Market, markets is an extensive anti-fraud system. Our laws prohibit fraud, including insider trading, market misrepresentations, and market manipulation. Development of international anti-fraud and manipulation standards should be an important near-term goal. I'm, I am pleased to tell you that I recently attended the International Conference of Securities Commissions, uh, and at that meeting there was considerable interest in developing international standards to prohibit market fraud. And I, uh, I will be working very strongly towards this goal in the near future. Third. And equally important is the public av availability of current price and quotation information for the major, major listed and over-the-counter equity securities. This availability has become an important part of our markets and a result in due in part to regulatory requirements. The availability of price and quotation information has contributed directly to the depth and liquidity of our equity markets. Moreover, the avail availability of this information has produced at least one major additional benefit by helping to make prices in the options market more reliable and efficient. Option mar options markets, in turn, have contributed to the efficiency of our equity markets. Based upon this experience, I believe the widespread availability of market information, like the disclosure and anti-fraud sta standards, seems to be an obvious candidate for global assimilation. Fourth, an important corollary for a sound national market in the United States has been the development of a national system for clearance and settlement of securities. Our clearance and settlement system is congressionally mandated, but I believe that economic forces alone would have produced a sound clearance and settlement system in the United States. We have had bad experience in the United States in that area, and the back office problems in the United States in the late, te late 1960s had severe repercussions for our securities industry. The current lack of satisfactory international clearance and settlement systems 
in the international, international clearance and settlement systems presents what I believe to be a disturbing parallel to our own 1960s experience. Our current settlement and clearance systems offer another area in which our domestic regulation and, and environment can serve as international models. Fifth, our broker dealers are regulated in many ways. They must register with a commission which, uh, which enacts and has statutory disqualification uh, of provisions and, and enacts rules guiding broker-dealer conduct. The stock exchanges and the National Association of Securities Dealers also regulate broker-dealers as members of their self-regulatory organizations. Their rules supplement and expand those of the Commission. Moreover, under our federal statutory structure, the responsibility for, for enforcement uh, of these federal securities laws requirements falls first on the broker-dealers, then on the self-regulatory agencies, and finally organizations, and then finally on the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC oversight acts as the shotgun behind the door to regulate broker-dealers. These provisions, too, merit uh, review by all countries participating in the international markets. Sixth, the financial integrity of firms is an important part of our regulations. Our securities laws provide for the financial soundness of broker-dealers by requiring, among other things, the segregation of customer funds and minimum levels of net capital. These rules contribute in a fundamental way to the efficiency of our markets by increasing investor confidence and preventing disruptions in broker-dealer services. Such fundamental financial integrity protections are increasingly important in an international environment in light of the multinational operations of many firms and the potentially global domino effects of a firm failure. Seventh, and a, a large and critical component of our system is a strong surveillance and enforcement system. Through cooperation between our exchanges, the NASD, and the Commission, the U.S. markets enjoy the most sophisticated automatic, automated surveillance system in the world. Coupled with a strong enforcement program, this surveillance has contributed to the vitality of our markets by increasing investor, investor confidence and participation. And as many have noted previously, strong surveillance and enforcement systems are also critical in an international environment. We must continue to develop bilateral or multilateral surveillance and enforcement arrangement, arrangements that are effective but are also sensitive to national sovereignty concerns. The agreements the United States has already worked out with the United Kingdom, Japan, and Switzerland, and others are good beginnings, but they must be tested by actual use and must be expanded to include other mar markets. Ultimately, it may be useful for the markets to create an international intermarket surveillance group along the lines of the Intermarket Surveillance Group recently formed in the United States. So in summary, I hope that uh, the international markets will look at our experience and will, will enact all or parts of the seven areas uh, which I think have underlay our experience and which make, uh, make our markets strong. Now, my, my emphasis on a sound regulatory environment as a predicate for sound international markets does not reflect the lack of concern for creation of competitive markets. Indeed, competition is a strong focus in our securities laws. In addition to imposing regulatory requirements, our laws also mandate the consideration of the competitive impact of regulatory actions and proposals, as well as prohibiting fixed minimum commission rates. By seeking competition, our laws reflect attitudes important to the international environment. I believe the institutional nature of international markets promote, promotes negotiated commissions and that a fixed commission rate structure will be incompatible with survival in an international environment in which open and competitive markets are likely to be the most efficient. Additionally, as I have suggested earlier, the increasing international competition between dealer and exchange systems indicates that international regulatory structures most probably must countenance both, sy both systems and in order to allow competition to determine uh, market structure. Now, if our uh, 
prehistoric fish had heard these remarks, that fish might accept the need for sound international market regulation. But I believe that our fish would also advocate the need for regulatory adaptation. I agree. And in of the few minutes left, I will hope to tell you uh, the areas in which, uh, some areas in which the Commission has shown its willingness to adapt, to adapt in the international arena, and to indicate our uh, willingness to do so in the future. The Commission and its staff already have taken forward-looking steps, including most recently the approval of international trading, quotation, and clearance and settlement links, no action relief, permitting U.S. institutional direct participation in certain, certain unregistered foreign officer offerings, the approval of waivers of certain listing standards for foreign issuers by the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange and the National Association of Securities Dealers, the grant of an exception, exemption from Rule 10b-6 for U.S. affiliated U.K. market makers during international offerings con conducted in part of the U.S., uh, and the Commission has also indicated its willingness to consider other creative ideas, including reciprocal or common prospectuses for international offerings, uh, the entertainment of discussions of, of a marketplace for trading unregistered foreign securities by certain large, sophisticated institutions under a so-called Rule 144A approach. These latter two provisions are at the staff stage, but they're things that we're looking at uh, quite, quite importantly. In summary, the key to sound international capital markets is to adopt and adapt existing rules and policies to the environment without jettisoning the bedrock investor protections that continue to be essential to market fairness and efficiency. I believe that the U.S. securities regulation system not only will survive, but will also serve as a model for evolving global regulatory standards. Hopefully fair and strong international markets will continue to grow and will be adapted in a manner so as to make our prehistoric fish uh, quite proud. Thank you. Any questions for Chairman Reuter, please? Yes, yes sir. Microphone. Excuse me. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you have internationally to enforce uh, the moralization of the markets. Uh, for example, uh, U.S. equities are listed everywhere in the world, so uh, you have to go and look for insiders, for example, in other markets. But my question is, how can you enforce such a regulation in other countries which do not use the same means. I would take an example, the Bursky affair. Uh, we would never, in, Euro, in most countries in Europe, we would never treat the problem the same way. Yes, I, I, I will respond to that question, but note that uh, I cannot discuss the Bursky matter because it, specifically because it's still a matter under investigation. Uh, the question really is, uh, how are we going to enforce our securities uh, fraud cases overseas when, uh, when uh, countries overseas may not have the same laws that we have. Uh, the first answer, answer to that is that I am pleased to say that many co countries are now considering the adoption of laws which are similar to ours, so that that question may not, uh, uh, may not arise so frequently in the future as it does today. That is, more countries are beginning to recognize that insider trading uh, is a Fraud uh, is a, it creates bad effects for the markets uh, and, uh, and should be eliminated. But even in those countries which do not consider insider trading to be, to be a bad thing, uh, we have made uh, sufficient progress uh, in obtaining a memoranda of understanding, particularly in, um, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, as well as in the UK and Japan, which will permit our enforcement uh, people to obtain uh, information from those markets uh, to deal with problems uh, which have occurred in our own markets. Now, that has been a long and extensive uh, series of uh, cooperative efforts, 
and it and these uh, these measures are are being uh, uh, adopted in a in this cooperative way so that not only do we promise we do we seek enforcement opportunities in other countries but we uh, uh, allow other countries to seek uh, our enforcement uh, the the structure of those arrangements as I understand them is that we uh, we do not seek to have our people going to the other countries for the purpose of engaging in investigations, but we do enlist the cooperation of authorities uh, in other countries for, um, uh, uh, for that investigatory work. Uh, the the Le Le Levine case, which was a pre boski case in this country, was one in which the uh, Swiss cooperated with us quite well uh, in allowing us to achieve that result. Could you, I, I understand you come to the microphone so we can hear you? Or have a microphone? I'm a former professor, so I tend to try to control the way the questions are asked. Can I just get a quick question in? The question has to do, the question is whether uh, events in today's domestic markets uh, are going to provoke uh, uh, current uh, activities by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I spoke uh, uh, on that topic uh, two weeks ago, approximately two weeks ago, and indicated that the Commission is looking seriously at, at volatility problems and uh, what will be happening in the next, uh, in the next weeks is that we will be examining the volatility problems as they uh, have existed during the past two weeks, uh, attempting to find out uh, causes, attempting to determine whether uh, uh, steps should be put in place to prevent uh, uh, volatility uh, from existing uh, in the future. From an international point of view, I think it will be equally important uh, that international cooperation exist uh, to prevent uh, uh, similar volatility uh, from existing. We have uh, had today, as I understand it, uh, uh, de decreases in both the uh, London and Japanese market, which are going to have effects upon uh, our own market, or probably will. Uh, and I expect that in the future that the Securities and Exchange Commission will not only be looking at uh, problems which may exist in the United States regarding volatility, but will be cooperating uh, with uh, uh, with regulatory agencies in other markets. There are, as you may be aware, uh, several markets in which uh, futures products are being developed for trading on those markets. Uh, futures products are being traded in markets overseas uh, based upon indices in the United States. Uh, futures products being developed in the United States based upon indices in other countries. Uh, I, have recently had, uh, com I have recently had conversations uh, here in the United States with uh, representatives of the uh, British uh, regulatory authorities and I am uh, I'm going to go to Japan at the end of this month to discuss the uh, uh, regulation with the uh, with the Japanese and uh, certainly uh, volatility uh, will be one of the topics on our agenda. Thank you very much Chairman Reuter. We appreciate very much your ability to come here on what must be a tough day at the SEC. Thank you. Thank you.